Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and we're back in Vermont at my brother Josh's maple syrup farm. And I wanted to, first of all, check in with him on Starlink, but we're also gonna take a look at his process about how he makes his maple syrup that I know a lot of you uh, enjoyed from the last video. Uh, now, the video we're making today is quite raw because I wasn't planning on doing anything, but I had my phone with me and I said, you know what, let's give it a shot and see if it comes out okay. And so far from our walk around the, the facility here, it's been pretty good. So we're gonna give it a shot. So how you doing, Josh? Quite well, and you? Good, how's the uh, Starlink working? I've been very pleased with it so far. So we've had winter. Yeah, we've made it through the four seasons. And Josh, you get a lot of snow up here, like whiteout snow all the time. Did it did it cut out when you had a big snowstorm? No, the uh, Starlink had no problem transmitting data through snow that you know I wouldn't be comfortable driving in, and I'll drive in just about anything. And uh, no matter how quickly it was dumping down, it had no problem melting snow off of it nor would snow accumulate on it. Yeah, we still have to come up here and do like a, a makeover because he's got a lot of uh, property to cover with his internet. So we're probably gonna do a outdoor unify thing on our next trip up. But what I put inside in the meantime is a uh, Google Wi-Fi mesh kit that I had that I reviewed a couple of years ago. And that seems to be working okay. Um, we're still struggling in some areas of the property. And I think it's just due to the geography that we're dealing with here and all the different obstructions. We've got wood and maple syrup and, and all this other stuff that I think is making some issues there. So we're going to kind of fix that up a bit. One thing I have noticed, Josh, is that the service is good. Like it doesn't cut out that often, does it? Yeah, it's actually been a barely measurable problem. I think I can count on one hand in that however many months it's been, how many times I've actually experienced a measurable downage. And then sometimes I'll open up the app and take a peek at it and it'll say, you know, you were down for four seconds in the last 12 or 24 hours or whatever it was. So uh, to be honest, it has not been an area of concern for me and I've been extremely pleased with what's been provided so far. Much better than what you had before. Yeah, before it would either be so slow you didn't know if it was working or it was just, you know, a tenth of a megabit per second uh, upstream. So when trying to do something for marketing or trying to do a YouTube channel or anything like that, um, impossible. And so it's really cool. So you got the YouTube video up. So we, we put up a video the other day of the Amish horse auction. This is something you wouldn't have done before because you didn't have the bandwidth, right? So talk about yeah, that. Yeah, I've always been inspired by my brother. You know, he's my smarter, old, early adopting older brother. And so uh, his success on uh, YouTube, as well as the support that you all, his community on YouTube, have shown me through uh, purchasing syrup, has just impressed me to the point where I said, you know what, I should invest a little bit of my own time and effort into this. So I made a handful of videos. One of them was like how to horse logging, that got like 2,500 views. Uh, Another one on putting up a uh, prefabricated steel building. We were building it and I said, oh, I'll just practice making a video. That got, you know, 28 views. <laughs> and then I did an Amish horse auction video, which is, you know, it's, it's interesting stuff if you've never seen one before. And uh, that thing's like over 50,000 yeah, views. Yeah, 60,000 as of this morning. <laughs> yeah, so uh, he's, he's, on his, he's on his way. So we're- It's we're, kind of exciting. It's and it's fun. good to have the bandwidth because if you didn't have the bandwidth, it couldn't get working. So. I would have had to leave the farm and spend a day or, you know, an afternoon at a library or someplace and, so yeah. it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's excellent. So I've been, Elon. I've been, no problem. So I've been measuring things. I mean, Elon. Elon, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've been measuring some things here at the, at the house. I've been up here for about 24 hours or so. So I've had a good day of experience and it feels good. It feels uh, a lot faster than it was when we were here last time. Uh, we did do a to the router test on that uh, Google Wi-Fi thing. So it's, it's coming in close to where we saw it in Connecticut when we installed it at my house briefly. Um, so it's been working pretty well here and the reliability has gotten much better. So when I arrived, I was, I, first thing I did when I got here was looked at the 12 hour report. And over that course of that last 12 hours, he had only two seconds of downtime. Uh, and then he had a little bit of an outage last night, but it was like at three o'clock in the morning. So I think it was maintenance that they were doing um, last night. So um, very minimal outages, at least from Josh's experience and what I saw here over the course of a day, but everything's been, been good. Um, and the other thing we checked was the obstructions that his dish has, because that's a big component of Starlink. If you have things in the way of the dish receiving its signals, uh, that of course has an impact and you need a very big area of the sky visible to the dish. And we were finding that um, Josh is really not dealing with any obstructions where he put it up on his roof. So I think we're in pretty good shape here. So overall, I think uh, Starlink for, for you is a winner. And this is kind of like the perfect place for Starlink because you have nothing out here, right? It's uh, We had DSL and uh, now our town is gonna spend half a million dollars trying to bring fiber or some okay. cable out here or something. But I live past the center of town. So the odds are that they're probably gonna stop in town or at least at the main roads that veer off. So uh, I probably won't be a beneficiary of 
of it, at least not right off. And so now I'm kicking myself at the town should have just bought a whole bunch of satellite dishes. Yeah, it made life a lot easier and cheaper. So, so uh, what I wanted to do now, though, was uh, take a little tour of the facility on how you make the syrup. Because one thing that we did not expect was that so many people who watched the first video bought syrup. So I'm sure people want to see the process. Um, so the first thing we're going to uh, cut to is a, a trip that we took out to the forest. Uh, Josh and I actually went hiking in my sweater. Um, and we went out to the forest where they, uh, where he pulls the, uh, the sap out of the trees. So why don't we cut to the forest trip and we'll see where the sap originates from. And then when we come back over here, we'll see how he processes it into maple syrup. So here we are in the forest where we are collecting maple sap to make maple syrup. Um, we use a system of pipelines to collect that sap. It's much more efficient than buckets. Here we have the two pipes of the conductor. So these are two parallel inch and a half lines. One's run above the other one. The lower line we call the wet line and that handles the majority of the sap that's flowing downhill to the sugar shack. The upper line we call the dry line and that allows us to convey vacuum to the furthest reaches of our sugar bush without being impeded by any sags in the line that might create an airlock. So we have our wet line and our dry line on the conductor. From there, we have our little Y formation here where the wet line comes in from a main line and then the dry line comes into the top of the main line over there. We also have a ball valve there so we can isolate it. During the season, if there are leaks on that line, we'll close that ball valve and then open it up slowly. And if we can hear uh, gas or air or CO2 rushing past the um, ball valve, then we know there's a leak on that line and that line needs attention. So we have conductors to our, you know, Y, we sometimes call this to the main line. And then over here, we have our saddle and our lateral line. And from here, it's just got a little bit of detritus on the outside of it. The inside of the pipe is rather clean, but we'll actually hold the line down. And as the sap collects in it, if the sap sits and puddles up nicely, we know that that line is tight and that our vacuum leak is not on that line. But if we see gas rushing past the sap that sits in this line, then we'll know that there's a leak out there. And we, we always look uphill. If we find an issue, we know that it's uphill of us. Uh, we can't really uh, uh, detect, well, we have to be downhill in order to detect the issues uphill. So main line, saddle on our lateral line. From the lateral line, we get to our first maple tree. And this is a drop. And so the drop is just a T fitting. They're a little bit stubborn in the off season, <laughs> but uh, we'll tap the tree and then we'll place this line into the spout. And then from there, we'll collect the sap via a combination of gravity and vacuum. So just these small lines just get inserted into trees. And how many trees do you have tapped, do you think? Oh, uh, several thousand. You know, you, wow. you don't like to uh, <laughs> a get lot. too specific. But um, yeah, thousands. And there's a lot to troubleshoot then if something is not properly Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting way to wire your mind to understand how the vacuum is affecting the system and be able to find the issues. And it's, you know, it, it can be learned quite quickly, but it's also, you know, a bunch of aha moments when you, you know, sniff out your first few leaks and then realize how a thousand tiny cuts can really uh, significantly impact It scales up. It yeah. scales up. And it's a lot like computer networking. It's kind of the same process. You have well, bandwidth. I not know. I'm not much of a computer <laughs> Well, I think networking. you could do well at computer networking that way. So yeah, Probably not if the air doesn't smell like this. <laughs> <laughs> so, Josh, as we were talking, I, I didn't realize that you have to untap all of these thousands of trees and then retap them at the beginning of the season? Yeah, I like to start the first week in January uh, getting out here with as big a crew as I can have just so it goes quickly. That way we're ready for early season uh, rushes. And uh, yeah, we go out and tap each of the trees and then uh, come the end of the season, we come back out and untap all the trees and then we jack the tubing up manually as high as we can so that deer, bear, moose, and people can all scurry around underneath. And, and it's snowing when you're doing this typically, right? Uh, there's, you know, one to three to five feet of snow on the ground when we tap. And then when you're untapping, uh, the little pry bar that we use to pop the spouts out, it benefits it to be about three or four feet long so that you can pop them out. Yeah, because they're way up there, so. And you can't leave it in over the over the, the winter because it hurts the tree. The tree won't be able to heal. Uh, one of the interesting things about maple is its ability to compartmentalize its wounds. So when we put a hole in it, the tree will, over the course of a year, seal off that hole and it'll heal over that hole. So we both want it to compartmentalize the wounded um, sub bark tissue, the candium in the wood. And then we also want it to close that hole so that more bacteria and detritus doesn't get inside. All right, Josh, so we saw where the sap comes from. 
and you burn wood to boil it. Explain the process a little bit and where this wood comes from. So uh, wood-fired maple syrup is not only sustainable, carbon neutral in the traditional way, but it also makes a superior product. Uh, I worked in the industry for, you know, seven or eight years before I started on my own. And a tendency in the industry was to move initially from wood to oil, and then from oil to oil-fired steam. And when you're cooking on steam, you're cooking at about 260 degrees. The benefits are it's very efficient when you're burning oil, and you can control that temperature so you'll never burn a pan. The downside is, is that you're cooking at a very low temperature and you don't get any caramelization of the sugars. So instead of getting a rich amber uh, color, you're gonna get a yellow kind of boring color and the, the flavor on your tongue is sweet, but the mapley je ne sais quoi doesn't really evolve unless you get that high heat caramelization. So both oil and wood, you're processing over a pan that's being licked by the flames and that's at about 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. And that high heat uh, just imparts a much better flavor. And then sometimes with the wood process, you know, the sugar shack smells wonderful with the sap and a little bit of wood smoke in the air hanging. And those little wisps of smoke that kiss the surface of our syrup impart the gentlest little hint of wood smoke. It's not a smoky flavor, but um, it's traditional, sustainable, carbon neutral. Why improve on perfection? and we love to do it. We also have to improve the health of our forest by culling diseased trees. Yeah, I was gonna ask you about that because all of these, all this wood that you burn comes from the forest that you're so stewarding. Far, so far, we've had enough work in the woods that we've been able to uh, source all of our wood from our own bush. So all this wood came from the same place you get the syrup from, yeah. or the sap from. Yeah, we burn about 25 to 40 cords a year, depending on production. And when, what time of year do you burn and make the syrup? Uh, the syrup comes in the spring when the uh, trees both freeze and thaw over a, a period. So when the cell wall of the tree freezes, the water expands and it pushes on that cell wall, uh, the cell wall being rigid. That creates ambient pressure within the tree. When the syrup, excuse me, the, the tree begins to thaw, the sap then gets squeezed out by that ambient pressure of the collective tree through the wound that we create through the tap hole. So when it's, when it's in season to get the sap out of the trees, the sap comes down here and you're processing it immediately, it sounds like. like. It's not something you wait until later in the year to do. Yeah, the sap, we try to process our sap, you know, within 12 to 24 hours of it uh, leaving the tree. Um, so, and we're in October right now, so this is not a time in which you're doing anything here beyond packaging and selling. Yeah, sales, marketing, yep. developing new bush. We're mm -hmm. getting into logging as well. It's been a little bit damp up until now, but it's starting to dry out. You want a good dry forest floor when you're harvesting to both keep the logs clean and to keep your roads in good shape. All right, let's go inside and have a look at the uh, facility. Excellent. So we're in the pump shed, and this is where uh, all the sap moves through and where we keep all of our mechanized equipment. On my left here is a 10 horsepower rotary vein vacuum pump. And people kind of have a misconception about vacuum pumps. And they say, well, you know, are you sucking the trees to dry? Are you damaging the trees with a vacuum pump? And I don't believe that that's the case. And there's been many studies done to corroborate that. Uh, his, people have been making maple syrup for hundreds of years. And they know that you can get about, you know, a gallon or two of sap per run from each tree. That would be per freeze-thaw cycle. And what we found is that with a vacuum pump, we're able to use smaller spouts. It used to be a five eighths inch hole that we would then hang a bucket from and the tree would bleed that gallon or two. Uh, with a vacuum pump, we can use a five sixteenths inch hole and get the same amount of sap. So a smaller the, hole. The name of the game is pressure differential. And so the tree, remember when it froze, it created pressure that was pushing the sap out. We're creating an artificial pressure differential with the vacuum pump. Now, when you have a vacuum, you can't have an open-ended vacuum. And so, this pipe over here goes to our releaser. And the releaser is a pair of cylinders that are both connected to all the trees in the bush via these inlet pipes, a vacuum pump up here, and the sap will come in and it will fill up this lower cylinder. Once this lower cylinder fills up, it triggers a float valve. Once that float valve is activated, it's gonna pump the sap into the tanks. It pumps it past the check valve, so that check valve will open as the sap flows out, and then once the valve, uh, excuse me, the pump turns off, that valve will slap shut and that will keep this system tight and sealed. So we're able to maintain a nearly perfect, you know, roughly 30 inch of mercury vacuum um, while we're pumping out sap. 
So it comes in here first, and then it goes out to the tanks. Exactly, and that's largely just a, a factor of the releaser, which is a delicate piece of equipment that needs to be uh, housed in a temperature-safe environment. But once the sap gets down here, this is our tank house, if you will, and this is where the sap is stored in these two 6,600-gallon uh, tanks. And then we also have uh, an old milk tank off of a milk truck that we use to store permeate. Uh, permeate is the byproduct of reverse osmosis, and we use that for cleaning. Um, but we basically will collect about 12,000 gallons of maple syrup in, you know, 12, 24, 48 hours, depending on the day. And then it's our goal to process that sap as quickly as possible to make the freshest, uh, richest, most delicious maple syrup for you all. So we have the sap outside, and now we're going to involve a little bit of modern technology to conserve a little bit of wood and maintain our uh, efficiency. This is reverse osmosis. Uh, osmosis is the diffusion of particles from high concentration to low concentration. Reverse osmosis is the concentration of particles in a solution from low concentration to high concentration. The sap that comes out of a tree is about 2% sugar. In order for it to be maple syrup, it has to be 66.9% sugar. Um, what this machine does is we have a series of membranes, six of them in this particular unit, and we pass the sap through it. As we do, we choke how much we're allowing out and apply a lot of pressure so it's forced to push through the membrane as it flows through. Uh, by doing this, the membrane, it's almost like a paper towel roll, except that paper towel is a film that has orifices in it that are so small that a molecule of water can pass through the orifice, but a molecule of sugar cannot. So we're squeezing that water out of the sap. We'll go from about 2% maple syrup to nearly 20%, excuse me, 2% sugar to nearly 20% sugar. And uh, what that does is it removes about 85 to 90% of the water that we would have to evaporate. Uh, right now we burn about 25 to 40 cords of firewood a year making our maple crop. Were it not for this machine, we would be burning between 250 and 400. Wow. So in order to maintain sustainability of our forest's ability to provide the energy uh, to, to make as much syrup as we need to to be viable, um, this machine allows us to do so much more economically and ecologically sensitively. And uh, I don't believe that it compromises the flavor in any way. We're still evaporating two, three gallons of water for every gallon of maple syrup that comes off. We're still exposing it to high heat and we're still getting that um, caramelization and that wood fire je ne sais quoi. So I don't think that this is uh, a bad compromise in the modern maple syrup industry. Now this is where it all happens, Josh, right? You got a nice... This is the sugar shack. Sugar shack here. And uh, the concentrated sap is pumped into that tank up there. And then gravity will draw the sap down into the evaporator. And we use a wood fire evaporator. And what happens is the sap is added to the back of the machine. And then as it is being evaporated off, you know, we have a high heat firebox underneath. So low concentration sap is added to the back. As that sap pushes forward, more and more is evaporating off and it's becoming denser and denser and denser and denser until we get a little stream of syrup at the front end of it. And we're able to maintain a constant flow of syrup out this end while adding low concentration sap in the back end. Uh, we have wood directly to the firebox, you know, the same wood that's outside. Here's a little bit of construction debris in our pile. And uh, the old joke is it's a heck of a place to hide a body. <laughs> But uh, seriously, folks, uh, it's sustainable, carbon neutral, and it imparts that maple je ne sais quoi in our final product. How do you maintain the temperature? Because it is wood, right? It varies. It, it feels like you're running a freight train in 1850 because you literally have to control the amount of air that you're applying to the different grates. You have to make sure that you have enough fuel. You have to make sure that that fuel is sufficiently preheated. And when you, even when you open the firebox, a rush of cold air will get drawn in by the flu. And so you're gonna lose temperature. So you almost have to know that you're continuing to evaporate, even though the thermometers that you're using to measure your rates of evaporation at different points in the process all drop. It's an art and a science. And over the course of years of much experience, we've really gotten it dialed into the point where we're, we always provide product that is heavier. Our target is to sell maple syrup that is half a brick, half a percent sweeter than the minimum standard. And we are always within three tenths of a point of that mark. And so we're always a little bit over and we're never too far over. If we go too far over, the worst that will happen is that you'll find crystals in the bottom of your maple syrup. However, uh, 
if you go under, then we have to reprocess it to get it up to snuff for you fine folks. So when, when, when you're in season, this place is hopping, I'm guessing, right? You're, oh you're, yeah, yeah, people will come by and take hot shots. They'll take samples right off the evaporator. But, um, you know, it's a little bit stressful for the, you know, the head evaporator, the head boiler. And then uh, he's usually got a henchman alongside of him mm -hmm. to uh, help him make sure that all the, the wheels are greased. And uh, actually, we'll draw it off into a smaller barrel here, and then we'll send it through a filter press. Um, the syrup as it comes out of the tree has niter in it, which is the mineral in the sap. And that'll often settle out in the evaporator, but if we were to put it into the final product, you wouldn't get a nice, clear maple syrup. It won't hurt you, but there'll be a sandy looking substance on the bottom. And Nobody wants that. Yeah. Syrup. It's unattractive. Mm -hmm. Some people actually do want it, mm -hmm. but um, it's unattractive for the, for the mass markets. So we send it through this filter press and then we get it into a barrel while it's still over 185 degrees Fahrenheit. That barrel is then hot sealed so the syrup is safe until we're ready to repackage it into our glass later in the year. Now, Josh, I, I am always drawn to this this wall of syrup here. So what are we looking at? And, and why is all of this stuff a different color? Well, these are samples from every barrel that we produce. And basically this is a good indicator of the different grades of maple syrup that are produced and why the different grades are produced. And so um, there are three things that affect the maple syrup grade. There's the quality of sap that the tree gives you, which includes the micro nutrient profile in that particular run of syrup. Then there's also the amount of bacteria that has an opportunity to grow in that sap before you process it. And then the third factor is the temperature at which you process the syrup and how long it's exposed to that temperature. So in order to make a very light and clear syrup, the tree needs to be running really hard and needs to be giving really sweet, really good mid-season or early mid-season syrup, sap, excuse me. And then once you have that sap that has the potential of being uh, golden or previously known as fancy syrup, um, then you have to process it very quickly before any bacteria has an opportunity to grow in it. And it has to move over that freight train of an evaporator very smoothly. If, it, if you make waves and it slows down and backs up and gets exposed to too much heat, then it's gonna darken and then you can't make that golden syrup. And some years you just can't do it because the sap isn't good to start with. Some that. years the trees just give you, in fact, this last year we weren't able to make any uh, golden or fancy syrup because the tree biology just didn't give us that opportunity. Um, it's also harder for us as a wood-fired sugar bush to make that fancy syrup because if you're cooking at 260 degrees over steam, you make exclusively fancy syrup. However, when you're doing a high heat caramelization wood-fired process, you're gonna get mostly darker syrups. It's actually been a real uh, struggle, or not a struggle, but a, a real uh, goal we set for ourselves to make some, as much fancy syrup as we can because all of your ducks have got to be in a row and you have to be working with great sap because when you're cooking with 260 degree um, surfaces, you're always going to make fancy syrup. But when you're cooking with a 1400 degree surface, you've got to really, you know, thread the eye of the needle in order to make that. What's the difference in taste between fancy and, and a darker? To be perfectly honest with you, sometimes the taste is less affected by the visual color and more affected by other uh, micro qualities in the syrup. However, you could say generally that lighter syrup uh, will just be sweet and not necessarily so mapley, if you will. Whereas um, the amber syrup is kind of the classic. Whenever you, if you're ordering syrup and you've never had syrup before, you really can't go wrong with amber. It pretty much always tastes like great maple syrup. And then dark and robust, there's a range of dark and robusts. And in my humble opinion, all of them taste good. However, some of them are much more robust. Some of them taste a lot more smoke, smoky and full bodied and have a lot more of a strong flavor. Um, a kind of rule of thumb that I give to people and they seem to like this as a way of thinking about it is that if you like spicy foods and not necessarily hot spicy, but if you have a complex palate, you enjoy things that are flavored, um, you might really enjoy that dark and robust syrup. And if you have a very simple palate and you just kind of like, you know, grilled cheese and French fries mm -hmm. and those kind of basic foods that mm -hmm. you can get a kid to eat, uh, you might be better off with golden syrup just because it's going to be sweet while not having so many subtle um, modifiers in the flavor. But at the end of the day, um, anything that goes out in our top three grades, which are uh, golden and delicate, amber and rich or dark and robust, anything in those top three grades is going to be excellent syrup. And then we do have a very dark and strong maple syrup. And that's kind of denoted by a 
metallic aftertaste. That's like the very late season syrup. And it's very robust. And that's good if you're making granola, if you're making cookies, if you're baking with it. However, it might be intimidating on the pancakes. It might not be the best maple syrup you've ever put on your pancakes. But I'll often put that in my refrigerator and enjoy it because it's not bad stuff. Well, Josh, thank you for this impromptu tour of your facility. I was trying to take a couple of days off and I was like, you know what? I got my phone. I can make a video. We can do a follow up and why not? And it's a beautiful weekend. The foliage has been just spectacular here. So uh, you live in a beautiful place and you've got a beautiful property and a beautiful product. Well, thanks, man. And it was a pleasure having you up. It was really nice to catch up with the family and uh, so glad that we're able to be within six feet of each other again. Yep. And, uh, it was a great little family reunion and I was really glad to have you. Good. Glad well, to have you as a brother. We'll, be, we'll be back up. We got more work to do up here. Thanks everybody for watching that. <laughs> <laughs> this channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Hot Sauce and Video Games, Brian Parker, Chris Allegretta, Tom Albrecht, Thomas Anfang, Jim Tannis, and handheld obsession. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.